Golden Boy with Feet of Clay Written by Captain Smiley Face J And read for you by Eleanor Elizabeth Summary Golden Boy with Feet of Clay Let me help you on your way A proper push will take you far But what a clumsy lad you are Stephen R. Ronaldson Lord Fowlsbane Or Inko is deemed an unfit parent, so Izuku is placed with Aizawa and his family against his will. Shinzo has some issues with that, and wants him gone. They both take things a little too far. Please, make yourself at home, Yamada-sensei had said. The man was softer when he was out of costume, warmer in a way that Izuku has to fight not to lean into. But he couldn't. He couldn't let himself get comfortable here. There was no point not when he would have to leave so soon. His mother would never be convicted. She wouldn't even lose parental rights. All she would have to do is tell the judge that Azuku used to be quirkless, and she would be pardoned. And why shouldn't she be? Was what she did really so bad? Azuku didn't think so. Not when he had to look Todoroki in the eyes and tell him the news, whilst knowing at the end of that same day, of every day, Todoroki would have to go home to the same hell that scarred him so many years ago. But even if, by some curse or blessing, his mom did lose parental rights, Izuku already knew that he would be passed into a different home. While Yamada-sensei's kind words of acceptance and sympathy rang true, and Eri-chan was obviously excited to have him around, he could easily tell that Aizawa-sensei was only tolerating him. And Shinzo-kun... What the hell are you doing? When Aizawa-sensei and Yamada-sensei were leading him into their house, they tried to let him know what living there would be like. He didn't even know that they were married, but he was far too melancholy to be excited. He did know that Aizawa-sensei was looking after Eri-chan, and he was briefly comforted by the thought of spending time with her. But then they told him that they'd recently adopted Shinzo-kun. Apparently, Aizawa-sensei was Tosan, and Yamada-sensei, being an English teacher, was dad. It was a cute system, and Aizawa liked Shinzo-kun, he really did, but the opposite couldn't be said. The boy had always had something against Izuku, and only seemed to grow angrier with time. For the last week, Izuku would even say that Hitoshi was going out of his way to let Izuku know exactly how much Hitoshi hated him. Izuku had already started plotting how to best avoid him when they dropped their next bomb on him. He would be sharing a room with Shinzo-kun. Hey, are you really ignoring me? When he got to the house, Eri-chan was waiting for him in the living room with a small black rabbit in her arms. His name is Dekaru-chan. Uravati-san helped me come up with it. He blinked and he found himself lying on the floor with Dekaru-chan settled on his chest. Unsure of what happened, he dragged his eyes to the side and saw Eri-chan sitting beside him, doing something. Izuku forgot what he was looking at and stared somewhere past her. He wasn't aware of anything around him for a while after that. He didn't know for how long. He didn't care. Oh, so you're finally showing your true colours. Not talking or reacting so the villain can't get you. Is that it? Eventually, something jostled Izuku's side, and he somehow convinced himself to turn his head again to figure out what the disturbance was. He didn't have to turn far to see Shunzukun looming above him. I'm supposed to set you up in my room. Dad wants you lying on my bed, not on the floor. Azuku got up and followed Shunzukun wordlessly. The next time he blinked, it was dark and he was on a bed. He knew it was Shunzukun's bed. He didn't belong in Shunzukun's bed. He had to get up. He didn't. He had to get up. He couldn't. He had to get up. He walked over to the desk chair and collapsed there instead. He didn't know how he did it. He would be proud, if it wasn't so pathetic that he struggled so much in the first place. This is... Honestly, I can't believe... You're in my room, my home, my desk, and this is how you're going to be. He was just sitting there. Why was he just sitting there? His hands weren't doing anything, just laying on his lap. They felt heavy. Too heavy. He knew they weren't. They weren't. Suddenly, his hands weren't on his lap anymore. They were in his hair, tussling it, pulling it slightly. Just enough to feel it. 
It felt nice. Izuku hated it. He wanted his hands to do something else. There was a pen on the desk. He could write. He liked writing. Writing was good. There were notebooks. But they were Shinzokun's notebooks. Izuku couldn't touch them. He needed paper. He could use his arm. It's bad enough that you're here at all. You should have gone with All Might or something, since he's so obsessed with you. The pen was a nice one, with a stiff felt tip. It scratched a little, but it wasn't sharp at all. How disappointing. He wrote. He wrote, and wrote, and wrote. And when he ran out of room, he wrote over what was already there. He didn't like it. He didn't want to cover up his words. But he had more to write. Maybe that wasn't good enough for you. You already have All Might wrapped around your finger. It wouldn't hurt to try and expand your collection. The symbol of peace, a top underground hero, and an expert on hero personas. You're building an arsenal. Not a bad move. If only you could pull it off. He heard Shinzo-kun's voice. He heard the words. He nearly processed them. Nearly. But not quite. A question about what he was doing? Azuku probably looked psychotic, to be fair. Maybe he was. Then, annoyance. Because Azuku didn't answer. It wasn't on purpose. He just couldn't. Then, anger. The same kind of words Shinzo-kun said at the sports festival. Shinzo-kun was wrong. So wrong. Izuku kept writing. It's not enough for you to be the golden boy. You have to be on top. You have to have every advantage. All of you perfect hero brats are like this. And people keep falling for it. Izuku kept writing. He was on his fourth layer of words. and His arm was nearly black. He wanted to keep going until there was no visible skin at all. Well, get this, golden boy. I won't let you. Izuku kept writing. He had to keep writing. He didn't, but he did. You can't have my dad's, you can't have my sister, and you certainly can't have me. Not my room, or my bed, or my desk. When you're here, you have nothing. Izuku toppled out of the chair. When he looked behind him to see what happened... He saw Shinzo-kun with a lethal glare, hands still out from having pushed him. Izuku put his head back down and kept writing. Was it even writing at this point? He couldn't see the words, so maybe not. Shinzo-kun scoffed before sitting in the chair and shuffling some things around. Glad you understand, golden boy. Izuku understood. Oh, and one more thing? Shinzo-kun scratched Izuku's wrist, finally halting his scribbling. Izuku met the other boy's eyes from where he towered above Izuku. They were dark. Leave my little sister alone. She thinks she loves you, but she doesn't. It's just the trauma. She's gotten so much happier and stronger here, and I won't let you ruin it. I don't know what you want from her, and I don't care. I won't let you hurt her. So don't bother her, and don't bother the rest of us. She needs us. Don't rob her of our time. Actually... Just stay in this room, don't make a noise, and don't leave unless one of my dads make you. Just pretend you're not here until they kick you out. Got it? Izuku got it. Shinzo-kun snarled at him before throwing Izuku's hand back towards his body. Great, now get back to being a psychopath or whatever. Izuku didn't feel like it. He was tired, so instead he leaned back against the wall, closed his eyes, and let go. When he woke up, it was dark and he was sore, but his head was a little more clear. He took a cautious look around and quickly spotted Shinzo-kun asleep in his bed. He wore a sleep mask and headphones. The message was clear. Do not disturb. That's fine. Izuku really wasn't planning to. No, he had other plans. It was one thing when he was just living here, being a minor inconvenience. He didn't like it but he could live with that. But even if Shinzo-kun was wrong about Azuku's motives, he still made Azuku wonder if he was going to be a bigger problem than Aizawa-sensei and Yamada-sensei let on. Who was Azuku kidding? The answer was right in front of his face. Problem child. Azuku wasn't sure if Aizawa-sensei had called him that recently, but it really didn't matter. In Azuku's emotionally compromised state, he knew he'd be even more of a problem than he normally was. Just because Aizawa-sensei and Yamada-sensei were playing nice didn't mean that they wanted him there, or that they even thought he was tolerable. They were just doing their jobs. How responsible. Admirable. Pitiable. 
Izuku should take the pressure off them. After all, Izuku had already accepted that this placement would be temporary. Why not cut it a little shorter? It wasn't like it was a big deal or anything. He couldn't hurt Eri-chan. Eri-chan was happy to have him there. But what did she know, really? Shinzo-kun was right. It was a trauma thing, and she would be better off with her family than with him. He would just take up their time, and consequently deprive her of it. He couldn't do that. He had to let go. In the morning, the only trace of him in the house was a single sticky note. Eri woke up to a loud yell. That happened sometimes, because Dad really liked to yell. He usually didn't do it so early, though. Eri let out a little annoyed huff and tried to go back to sleep. But she couldn't, because people were running around in the hallways. Eri wasn't allowed to do that, so how come they were? And she was still so tired. But the ruckus... Otosan taught her that word. It meant noise, and Deku and Nissan's class supposedly made a lot of it. Didn't stop. So she rolled out of bed, tucked her really cool rainbow blanket back around the bed, like she was supposed to, and wandered out to see what the noise was for. When she got to the end of the hallway, Otosan nearly choked over her. That was why they weren't supposed to run in the house. She almost even said so, but then she took in the strange way that Otosan looked. Sh- so- sorry, Eri he said quickly. Then he walked down the hall, but like, really fast. Like when Eri gets dressed and is ready to go see heroes, so she walks to the door as quickly as possible. Her parents didn't really like that either. But he looked... not good. He had his work jumpsuit on, but it was handed over his waist so it was just pants. On top, he still wore his favourite pyjamas. The really soft ones with the little kittens and yarn balls on it. That seemed odd, His hair was in a bun, but a really bad one, with hair poking out all over. And why was he in such a hurry? Um, she tried to ask, but he was already back in his room. Maybe he remembered his pyjamas and went to take them off? Eri didn't think it would be very comfortable to wear two sets of clothes. Eri! She turned around and saw Dad. Maybe he knew why Otto-san was acting so weird. She walked up to him to ask, but before she could, Dad was already asking her a question. Eri, sunshine, have you seen Midoriya? Did he talk to you last night? Deku? Nuh-uh, not after he went into Nissan's room. Nissan talked to him, though, and he was very mean. How was he being mean, Eri? She tried to tell him what she'd heard, but she was interrupted again, this time by Otosan. Everyone was being very rude today. I'm going to go wake up Hitoshi. Mike, call Azuka's friends and see if they know anything. Mike? Otosan turned to go to Nissan's room really quickly. Otosan only called Dad Mike when they were at UA. Was Otosan okay? After one quick look at Dad, she followed Otosan to make sure he wasn't upset or something. She stood in the doorway next to Nissan's room because she didn't want to go inside unless Nissan said it was okay, but that was close enough, really. Otosan was sitting on the side of Nissan's bed, and Nissan was making a grumbling noise. Grumbling is the sound a tummy makes when it's hungry, but Dad said it was also the sound that people sometimes make when they're annoyed, which confused Eri at first, and he swatted his eye mask and headphones off. As soon as Nissan sat up, Otosan asked a question about Deku too. When was the last time you saw Midoriya? Nissan's face went all scrunched up, and then he looked at his phone to see the time. Then his face was even more weird. Before I went to bed, did you notice anything odd? Um, no. Hitoshi leaned back. Why? Because he's gone, and he left this note on the front door. Gone? Deku was gone? Gone where? Otosan handed Nissan a bright pink sticky note, but when Hitoshi read it, he just rolled his eyes and gave it back. Nissan wasn't supposed to roll his eyes, but Otosan didn't even say anything about it. Something was very wrong. Maybe Deku wasn't supposed to leave, and now everyone's worried. Did anything happen? Otosan asked next. No. Nissan said, but that wasn't true. Nissan is lying, Eri snitched, but she had to. If Deku was gone, and Otosan was asking questions about him, that meant Otosan was definitely looking for him. That meant Nissan had to tell the truth. He was all mean to Deku yesterday. Really? Otosan asked, and his voice wasn't gentle or nice. It scared Eri a little, but she could be brave for Deku. She had to. How so? 
he said that Deku was just trying to use you and dad by being here instead of with All Might and that he was a bat and pushed him out of the chair and onto the floor and then he said that I don't really love him and that you and dad were going to kick him out and then Nissan called Deku a psychopath. Eri rushed out in one breath. Best to get it out quickly. Oh, that's why Otosan was walking so fast. Hitoshi? Otosan looked away from her. Is all of that true? Yeah, but he's dangerous, Otosan. Dangerous? How could he be dangerous? He was so kind, and he's a hero, the strongest hero she's ever seen. Explain. Tell me what happened in your own words. He's trying to use you, Nissan said. His voice was very hard. His mom has no reason to be abusive, and even if she was, he could have just gone with all might. He didn't have to come here. He just wants to take advantage of the situation and get even more heroes wrapped around his foot um, messed up fingers. So after I came back to my room and I saw him awake and sitting at my desk, I just wanted to talk to him, but he wouldn't respond. He was acting just like everyone else, staying silent because he's scared of my quirk. No, he... Eri interrupted. She wasn't supposed to interrupt, but that was wrong. Deku wasn't ignoring anyone. He was just away. It wasn't his fault. Eri, give Hitoshi a chance to explain. Otosan said sternly. Eri looked down with a pout, but not before she saw Nissan give her a mean but not mean look, the kind he used when he won an argument. It made Eri really annoyed. He just... he wouldn't respond, Nissan kept explaining, but his voice wasn't so hard now. It was more normal. So I got angry. I told him that I was onto him and that I knew he was just going to use him. I told him that I wouldn't let him. He kept ignoring me, just scribbling on his arm like a maniac. Eri didn't know what that meant, but she could guess. But I... Nissan's voice got quieter. I pushed him out of the desk chair, and he didn't even get up or retaliate. Eri didn't know what that meant at all. So I assumed he understood. But even then, I had to say one more thing. Because... Because I don't know what he wants with Eri, and I don't want him to hurt her. So I told him to stay away, to just stay in my room until it's time for him to leave, and reminded him that her affection, that was like love, right? For him was just because of trauma, not because of any real relationship. Then I left him alone for the rest of the night. I just know he has bad intentions. Eri wished Hitoshi would use less big words. With all of you, and so I did what any good older brother would do. Eri frowned. She didn't like that. She didn't want Nissan to be mean. And what did Midoriya do after that? Otosan asked with a patience that seemed somehow not right to Eri, like a trap. But Otosan wouldn't do that. I don't know. I don't think he moved from that spot on the floor. Okay, Otosan said, then took a deep breath. Okay, thank you for being honest. Then he got up and started to leave. Otosan, wh- where are you going? Nissan almost fell out of the bed to follow their father, to see if Hazashi found anything from contacting Midoriya's friends. Whether you trust him or not, we will be talking about the things you said to him later. We are his legal guardians, and we have to bring him back here. What? B- it's better if he's gone. What? Hatoshi! Otosan snapped. Otosan never snapped. Not like that. Sit down! We will discuss this later, once I'm certain that my problem child is safe. Nissan made the scrunchiest face yet, a really angry one. But Otosan and Eri were really mad too. He sat down. Otosan left the moment Nissan was down, but Eri didn't. She stayed and tried to give Nissan her best I'm mad at you face. You're a butthole, she accused. Eri, look, I'm just I'm looking out for you. No, she argued. She didn't need protection from Deku, so... You're just being mean! I'm not, he said with a very solid voice. Midoriya isn't who you think he is. No, he's not who you think he is! You don't understand, because he saved you, but he's dangerous, Eri. He's not! He's hurt! He can't be! He's perfect! What do you mean he's perfect? And why was that bad? His quirk, Eri. Hitoshi bit out as he stood up and walked to her. 
Nissan was very tall, and Eri was very not. Think about it. Every bad thing that's ever happened to us happened because of our quirks, right? But he has a heroic quirk that everyone loves, so he hasn't had to deal with anything like we have. Well, that didn't make much sense. What do quirks have to do with being mean? So? She asked loudly to show her anger. What do you mean, so? I mean, so. Bad things happen to everyone. Oto-san said. He said he has all those scars, like me. And he's brave, and he's scared, and he... That's different, Nissan yelled. Eri didn't feel so brave anymore. That was a bad yell. That was a yell that made Eri want to be quiet and escape. She spun around and ran back to her room, shutting the door quickly but quietly, and running to get under her blanket. She wanted to be quiet, but she started crying by mistake. She put her hand over her mouth. She was scared it wouldn't help very much, though. Eri? Nissan called after a moment. He didn't sound angry any more, but sometimes angry people would pretend to make her trust them. But only the bad people did that, and Nissan wasn't a bad person. Still, she hid. I'm sorry for yelling, Eri. I, I'm going to go wait in my room until we both calm down, and then we can talk about it. Angry people didn't usually do that. Nissan was very special. But Eri was still scared, so she stayed under her blanket. Otosan said it was okay to be scared, even if she wasn't in danger. She hoped Deku would come home soon. His hugs always made her feel better. Izuku didn't say anything, but his friends gave me a list of places to check, Hizashi reported. This sucked. This really, really sucked. Sunday mornings were for sleepy cuddles and his wonderful husband and a big family breakfast. And Hizashi was so excited for this one. He had a new little one to impress with his culinary skills, after all. He wanted to welcome Adoria, give him kindness and make him feel safe. Wanted. But now, he was gone, and just leaving a tiny note that said, Thank you very much for your hospitality. I think it would be best for me to stay somewhere else until they release Mum. But really, thank you. Smiley face. Poor kid. Let me see, Shota said, leaning over his shoulder. Despite the fact that Shota had used Hizashi's hero name, Hizashi still felt a comforting hand slip around his waist in a half-hug, while Shota read. Most of these are either around his old place or UA. I'll get the ones near his house, you get UA. Then we'll hit the outliers. You got it, Eraser! Hizashi said, pumping his usual hero cheer into his voice. But Shota could obviously tell how hollow it was. Let's walk to the train station together, just so I can update you with what I learnt from Hitoshi. Just for that, yeah? Hizashi teased gently. Shota just rolled his eyes, and he wondered where Hitoshi got it from. After grabbing the last bits of his costume, a speaker and his jacket, they started their trek. Hizashi was not impressed with what Shota told him. He couldn't believe Hitoshi would act like that. He knew Hitoshi had a few issues with people with strong quirks, and that he was sometimes so defensive that he turned offensive. And yeah, he also knew that Hitoshi was annoyed by Izuku in particular. But still, Hizashi thought Hitoshi had better self-control than that. He thought he was better than the things he'd done. No, that was too harsh. It was hard for Hitoshi too. A new person in the house, sharing his room, sharing his home and his family. Hizashi understood why Hitoshi would lash out. But still. They would have to talk about that, later. First, they needed to get Izuku back. But he wasn't at the corner store where Uraraka said they liked to buy the cheapest snacks. A good place to go when on the run. The cashier said he hadn't seen Izuku, and he'd been there since midnight. He wasn't anywhere near the pond where he and Todoroki would sometimes go to hide out, either. There was good coverage. It was a serene, hidden place, but not too far away from any good food sources. It was a place where someone could easily hide out for a while. Ida had suggested a running trail that they would occasionally go to. It wound up a mountain, and there were a couple of cabins along the way. With Izuku's quirk, he could get to one quickly. With Hazashi's motorcycle licence and a rented dirt bike, he could get there quicker. They were all undisturbed. God damn it! Where did the kid go? Why did the kid go? Hitoshi was cruel to him, but Hizashi didn't think Izuku was a flight risk. He was too... responsible. Well-behaved in class. Too gentle. 
Too dissociated, at least last night. Hizashi should have considered Azuku's anxiety, his abuse, his borderline fearful obedience towards teachers, his general tendency to value other people's comfort over his own well-being. Hizashi didn't even know the kid that well, and it was so obvious. How did Azuku get through a year at UA without anyone noticing? Oh, if Hizashi was beating himself up over not noticing, Shota must be in really bad shape. That man loved his problem child to bits, no matter what he said. He once confided in Hizashi that he seriously thought about attacking the child with bubble wrap after he fell down the stairs for the too manyth time. Now, the little guy was missing. Hizashi would have to plan something extra relaxing after this. By the time six or so hours passed, they'd hit nearly all the locations listed and were soon to move on to a more general search, with more people involved. Shota would get started on that, though. They had left their house in a tumultuous state, so Hizashi had to go make sure their other kids were all right. When he arrived, his darling son was sitting on the floor outside of his sister's room, pouting. Hizashi connected the dots quickly. Toshi, he called. Leave her be. Hitoshi jolted and regarded Hizashi for a few seconds, before turning back to stare blindly at the wall across from him. She's upset, Hitoshi argued. She is, and she has every right to feel that way. The tall man all but collapsed on himself to sit by Hitoshi. He sensed this was going to take some time to handle. But she's upset with me, Hitoshi emphasised. His distress leaked through his generally stoic features. Yes, you yelled at her and told her that her hero was a bad person who doesn't deserve help or a family. That's not what I said! Hitoshi immediately defended himself. Maybe not, but that's what she heard. And it's kind of what Sho and I heard too. I guess we're all having a little trouble understanding what's going on in your head and why you said the things you did. Hizashi explained as gently as he could. He didn't want to accuse anyone. Not right now. It wouldn't help any. Because... Hitoshi cut himself off with a sigh and ran a hand down his face. Where's Otasan? Out looking for Midoriya still. His friends don't know where he is, but they told us some places he likes to go and some things he does to de-stress, so Sho's following on some more of those leads. Hitoshi scoffed. Hey, don't be like that, Hizashi scolded. Why are you so against Midoriya anyway? He knew it stemmed from Izuku's quirk. It was about discrimination, perceived slights, jealousy, and spite. But he wanted to hear how Hitoshi thought of it, and how it had changed from its roots. I don't understand what you and Otosan don't get. You should be able to see past his act. Hitoshi dodged the question. A part of Hizashi wanted to coo how clever his son was, but he was a little too pissed at him at the moment. Instead, Hizashi sighed. I won't say he doesn't have an act because that would be a lie. But it's not the one you think it is. And you're right. We should have noticed it sooner. It's just hard, you know. Here comes this bright, cheerful kid who just wants to make friends and save people. Sure, he doesn't know how to use his quirk, but it's just overconfidence, right? Same thing with him jumping into fights he's not ready for. Just a little arrogance. Nothing that can't be trained out of him. Never mind that he's never displayed arrogance to that level in any other circumstance, ever. And yeah, maybe he's a little anxious the rest of the time, a little jumpy, flinches at sudden moves, shies away from raised voices, but some kids are just like that, and he bounces back so quickly. Surely nothing could be wrong, not when he's so bubbly, not when he's so powerful. Bad things don't happen to bubbly, powerful people. So he's a little anxious. It's fine, that can be trained too. He also cries a lot. Not when significantly bad things happen, no, just when people are nice to him. Or when something small happens and he just sort of... breaks down. Weird, right? What a quirky little dude. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. Some people are just emotional. It's not a problem for hero work, so, as his teachers, it's not really a problem for us. He'll probably grow out of it anyways. Best to just ignore it. I just... Wish we'd put it together sooner. Hitoshi, what do you make of a teenager who can't use his quirk without hurting himself, jumps in the way of any and all danger without a second thought, never looks anyone in the eyes, stutters, insists on walking behind others, flinches at quick movements and yelling, 
cries when people are kind, and breaks down frequently over seemingly small issues, but not the big ones. You're wrong. Hitoshi bit out with a scowl. People like him don't deal with problems like that. Oh, Hitoshi. No, if only it were that simple. Hitoshi must know that it's not. So why is he holding on to this? Really? What if they're trans? Hizashi asked. Wait, he's... Or what if they're not straight? What if they're autistic? Or if they have a mental problem, for example, a psychotic disorder? Hitoshi flinched. Good. He knew it was wrong. What if they have anxiety or depression or their parents just can't cope? What if their parents have untreated mental disorders or other problems and they take it out on the kid? What if the parents have a nasty divorce and they blame the kid? What if the kid got kidnapped or assaulted when they were young, too small and scared to escape? What if they have chronic pain or health disorder? What if they lost their home to debt or some kind of disaster? What if a million other things happened? Do people like him have to deal with problems like that then? Hizashi kept his voice calm and level the whole time. He was lecturing, not arguing. That was important. Did... did any of those things happen to Midoriya? Hitoshi asked in a small voice. Does it matter? What? Hitoshi, you have to know that misfortune is not reserved for any type of person. You can't assume, not based on demeanour, quirk, or whatever else. But even if it was that simple, even if bad things only ever happened to the people you'd think they would, that wouldn't give you the right to treat anyone the way you treated Midoriya last night. Hitoshi froze, his face pale. In realisation of how wrong his actions were last night, or due to questioning the way he treated nearly everyone in the hero course. But... I... <sighs> I don't understand. He's... I thought he was going to hurt us, so I... He trailed off. Got angry at a boy who was clearly dissociative for ignoring you. And I know you know what dissociation looks like, especially when it's that bad. Then physically assaulted him, told him that he isn't loved, and threatened him to stay in a single room until he's inevitably abandoned. Hitoshi didn't seem to have a response for that. He just gaped. But it was clear that his mind was working, struggling to re-comprehend a concept that was so important to him. Shota and Hizashi shouldn't have put off this lesson for so long. I love you, Toshi, and I'm sorry for being so harsh. But that was unacceptable, Hizashi said. Hitoshi ducked his head and tried to take even breaths. Hizashi winced. He was supposed to calm things down, not cause an existential crisis. The conversation needed to happen. But did it need to happen right then? But, but he, he... Hitoshi choked, but didn't cry. What is it, Toshi? He, he's so, so perfect. He, he has to, he has to be bad. Why? Hizashi asked softly. He really just didn't get it but he wanted to. Hitoshi didn't respond. Toshi, why does he have to be bad? He was silent, and his body started to tense and curl up. His breathing got worse. Hey, hey, Toshi, it's all right. Come on, deep breaths. Trying, Hitoshi gritted out, obviously annoyed. Hisashi just wanted to help. His son's breathing suddenly shuttered, and then quickly decelerated back to normal. He turned away from Hizashi. That probably wasn't a good sign. Toshi? Fine, just need a minute. You should probably go help Otosan find Midoriya. Hitoshi mumbled. Mumbled. Hitoshi only mumbled when he was asleep. I'll do that after everything is okay here. I'm not going to leave you alone like this, Toshi. Hitoshi shuddered before answering. It's... I'll be okay. I really just need a minute. You can go. Toshi. It's important you find him quickly, right? I'll be here when you're done, Hitoshi insisted. And Hitoshi wasn't exactly wrong. Hitoshi was here. He was safe. They could work on this more another time. Hell, maybe it would be good to leave it at this and give Toshi some time to process before they talk about it again. 
His Aji was more direct than he typically would be, and he's given Hitoshi a lot to chew on, but he hated to leave him after a near panic attack. But he cared about Azuku too. Azuku was his responsibility, his future son if he had any say in it, no matter how many times Shota reminded him that Inko was still on trial, and Hazashi didn't know if he was safe. Damn it. Toshi, please look at me. Hitoshi hesitated, but turned back to him and allowed Hizashi to gently cup his face. I love you. You know that, right? Yeah, Hitoshi sighed, leaning his head into Hizashi's hands. I know. I love you too. Hizashi smiled tenderly at his son. For a long moment, everything was still. But it had to pass. Soon, with a soft grunt. All right, I better head out then. He knocked on the door Hitoshi was still leaning on. Eri, sweetie, you gonna be all right till your Oda-san and I get back later? Yeah, she said, voice right on the other side of the door. Hitoshi jumped, making Hizashi huff in amusement and nudge Hitoshi with his foot. All right, love you. L love you too, and you too, Nisan, she added with a small voice. Love you too, Imoto. Hizashi's babies were so damn precious. He loved them so much. With one last smile towards Hitoshi, Hizashi pulled out his phone and made a swift exit. He had another precious baby now, and Hizashi couldn't leave him all alone. Hitoshi had an idea. It was probably a bad one, but his parents had been gone for hours. Eri still hadn't come out of her room, and it was all Hitoshi's fault. He had to at least try. He allowed himself exactly one deep breath before hitting send. Class 1A. Shinzo. Has anyone heard from Midoriya? Sent. 5.12pm. He didn't know what he really expected. He'd never said anything in the group chat before, and he knew he wasn't exactly in good standing with the class. Most of them had tried hard to welcome him, and some of them hadn't given up yet, but the last few days had been... rough. Ever since the rumours about Midoriya's home life came out, Hitoshi had been extra antagonistic towards him, while the rest of the class had grown more defensive. It caused a bit of a riff. Hitoshi couldn't have cared less a day ago, but it was a problem now. Still, maybe... Class 1A. Todoroki. Why? Sent? 5.17pm. Hmm, no. Hitoshi already knew that Todoroki wouldn't be helping him. He adored Midoriya and had no patience for Hitoshi. He showed basically no interest at first, but had been one of the first ones to start glaring when Hitoshi gave Midoriya shit. Hitoshi thought it was probably quirkism, since he didn't glare that much when Bakugo treated Midoriya like that, but he was reconsidering now. It could still be true, but... Class 1A. Kirishima. Yeah, why do you want to know? Sent. 5.18pm. Todoroki. No, why would he think we would ever tell him anything about Midoriya? Sent. 5.18pm. Kirishima. That too. Sent. 5.18pm. Okay, he could worry about that later. For now, he had a mission. Class 1A. Shinzo. Look, I know I've been an arsehole, but I'm trying to help here. Sent. 5.19pm. Kirishima. Help with what? Sent. 5.19pm. Shinzo. Uh, okay. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell you this, but his foster parents are also my adoptive parents, and I may have said something to him that made him run off. Sent. 5.19pm. Kirishima. Wait, foster parents? So all that stuff was definitely true. Is he okay? Sent. 5.19pm. Shinzo. Shit, I assumed he at least told you all that much. Sent. 5.20pm. Todoroki. Our teachers are already looking for him. They hardly need your help. Sent. 5.20pm. Kirishima. Todoroki, you knew? Sent. 5.20. Ashido. Wait, hold on. What's up with Mido? Sent. 5.20. Uraraka. He doesn't want people to know right now. Leave it alone. Sent. 5.20. Ida. We shouldn't discuss this in the group chat. It is a private matter and one best left to the pros and anyone already involved. 
Sent. 520. Shinzo. It's been hours. They only asked a few people, right? Maybe Midoriya mentioned something to one of the people Mike Sensei didn't ask. Sent. 522. Uraraka. Just leave him alone, Shinzo. Sent. 522. Shinzo. It's all my fault. I just want to help fix it. Sent. 522. Uraraka. Why all of a sudden? Sent. 522. Todoroki. You've been a dick to him since you joined the class. Why do you care now? Sent. 522. Shinzo. You two already told Mike Sensei everything you know. I don't have to prove myself to you. Sent. 523. Todoroki. You think the rest of them are any more inclined to believe you? Sent. 523. Ashido. Todoroki's right. Sent. 523. Jiro. It wouldn't do any good for the rest of us to help you find Midoriya if you're just going to treat him like shit. Sent. 524. Ida. If anyone has any information, please pass it to me or directly to one of our teachers. They are more equipped to help Midoriya than Shinzo is. Now, please stop discussing this. Midoriya will not be happy to see us discussing his personal problems in front of the whole class. Thank you. Sent. 524. God. What was he supposed to say? What could he ever say that would make them believe him? He barely believed himself. He didn't know how to feel about Midoriya right now. He hated him, or at least what he represented. He was everything that a hero student was supposed to be. Well, he was everything a hero student shouldn't be. He was the antithesis of Hitoshi, the things he swore he would never become. But Dad said he had it all wrong. He said that the mask Midoriya put on every day didn't hide the things Hitoshi thought it hid. He thought it hid mockery when Midoriya was kind, apathy when he cared, judgment when he watched all of his classmates and said, you're so cool, like a child watching TV. Dad said he was wrong. Dad said Midoriya hid fear, pain and insecurity. He said Midoriya hid scars and he didn't even hide them that well. And Hitoshi denied it. Hitoshi was everything he went through and everything he would be in spite of that. He wanted to prove to everyone, but especially to all the hero brats, that a quirk didn't make a person. Hero brats weren't special, and Hitoshi wanted to be their wake-up call. But if Midoriya wasn't secretly evil, then who was Hitoshi opposing? Dad must be wrong. Well, maybe a bit right. Bad things do happen sometimes, even to hero brats. But that's the exception to the rule. More bad, generally worse things happen to people like Hitoshi, and maybe quirkless people. So, okay, Hitoshi was opposing most hero brats, and Midoriya was one of their leaders. In their class, it was Bakugo and Midoriya, and sometimes Todoroki. They were the leaders, no matter what Ida and Yayorozu did, and Hitoshi was just expected to believe that one of them was secretly like him. He couldn't. He wouldn't. But maybe he could give Midoriya a chance? If something bad did happen to him, which it didn't, but if it did, then Hitoshi was being a real ass. Dad said the things Hitoshi did weren't okay regardless. In retrospect, yeah, he went too far. Even with what Midoriya represented, it wasn't like Midoriya had ever actually done anything to anyone, not as far as Hitoshi knew. And yeah, Hitoshi did know that Midoriya was dissociating. He was just so angry that he didn't think of it at the time. All he knew was that Midoriya was in his house, in his room, getting care from his parents, and he wanted Midoriya gone. So he... did that. If Hitoshi's actions were awful under normal circumstances... Then if something was really wrong with Midoriya, what Hitoshi did was actually really fucked up. So, it was a really good thing that there was no way that the golden hero child in Hitoshi's class just happened to be the exception. But Hitoshi couldn't deny the dissociation. He couldn't deny Midoriya's borderline suicidal tendencies, and the way he avoided praise for them. The way he avoided praise for anything... It it didn't look like the arrogance Hitoshi assumed he had, and it didn't look like forced modesty. It didn't even look like real modesty. 
it looked like imposter syndrome. It looked like fear and doubt and an inability to value himself. And the flinching. His phone buzzed. Please, please be someone willing to help. Class 1A. Bakugo. Eye bags. Sent. 5.30. Shinzo. Question mark. Sent. 5.30. Bakugo. Give me one good reason to help you instead of listening to four eyes. Sent. 5.30. Kirishima. Do you know where he is? Sent. 5.30. Ashido. You know where Mido is? Sent. 5.30. Jiro. Question mark. Sent. 5.30. Todoroki. You found him? Sent. 5.30. Ida. It is imperative to pass any useful information to the pros involved in the case and not talk about it in the class group chat. Sent. 5.30. Uraraka. Dude. Sent. 5.30. Shinzo. I don't know. It's hard to explain. One of my parents set me down after they found out what I did and they talked to me about it and I guess something they said just really clicked because I get it now. I get what I did was wrong. I get the way that I was thinking was wrong. Maybe I was wrong in other ways too. I don't know. But I hurt him and I know that I want to be better and I want to help him. Shinzo. And my baby sister called me a butthole for being mean to him and that actually hurt a lot. Sent. 5.33. Bakugo. I didn't ask for your fucking sob story. I asked why I should tell you instead of a teacher. Sent. 5.37. Ida. You shouldn't. Sent. 5.37. Bakugo. Shut the fuck up, you hypocrite nerd. Sent. 5.38. Uraraka. Go to bed at 8.30 and get straight A's, you hypocrite nerd. Sent. 5.38. Bakugo. Shut the fuck up, simp. Sent. 5.38. Shinzo. Argue later. Sent. 5.38. Shinzo. To answer your question. Sent. 5.39. Shinzo. Our teachers could drag him back, but they can't convince him to stay. I think... I think he'll just wait for the opportunity to leave again, because he'll be stuck on the reason he left in the first place. But maybe since I'm the one who said it, if I take it back and explain why I said it and why I was wrong, maybe he'll actually listen and give it a chance. Sent. 5.44. Bakugo. I doubt it. Sent. 5.51. Bakugo. But it's worth a shot. Sent. 5.51. Bakugo. Did any of you losers tell Mike Sensei to check the beach? Sent. 5.51. Uraraka. What beach? Sent. 5.51. Ida. I'm not sure what you mean. Sent. 5.51. Todoroki. No. Sent. 5.51. Bakugo. There you go. Try that. Sent. 5.52. Shinzo. What beach? Sent. 5.52. Bakugo. Dagaba. Sent. 5.52. Shinzo. Trash Beach? Where exactly? Sent. 5.52. Todoroki? No. Someone cleaned it. Sent. 5.52. Bakugo. Fucking Deku cleaned it. Just look around. This is your problem, not mine. Sent. 5.53. Ashido. Mido cleaned the beach? Like, by himself? Sent. 5.53. Kirishima. Bro, that's so manly. How come he didn't tell anyone? Sent. 5.53. Bakugo. He has a panic attack every time someone so much as thanks him for lending them a pencil. You want to know why he didn't call the press on himself for cleaning a whole ass beach? Sent. 5.54. Kirishima. Okay, okay, damn. Sent. 5.54. Uraraka. As long as you're volunteering forbidden information, got anything on why exactly he has panic attacks when thanked? Sent. 5.55. Bakugo. No. Sent. 5.55. Hitoshi muted the chat. He had all he needed, hopefully, from Bakugo of all people. Unless Midoriya wasn't there, and Hitoshi did all that for nothing. Regardless of that possibility... He had to try. Eri? 
he called out. She still hadn't left her room in the hour it took to get that information, but he didn't think she was too upset with him anymore. She cracked her door open and peeked out, hopefully. I've got a lead on Midoriya. I'm going to go try and find him. What? I want to come? She tumbled from her doorway, rushing to the entry and putting her little shoes on. Eri, you can't, Hitoshi started, but cut himself off. Would having Eri there help? She could convince him to come back, as well as to stay. She could convince him that she loves him, and maybe it'll be easier to talk with her there. Maybe she could even do most of it. Also, he shouldn't leave her in the house alone. But what if Midoriya had harsh words for Hitoshi, but held back for Eri? Hitoshi knew this would be a very bad time to censor him. Also, it would be terrible of him to use her to fix his own mistake, wouldn't it? Eri, I think you should stay. But hear me out, okay? I know he loves you very much, and he wants to be good for you. But right now, I think he needs the freedom to be upset if he wants to. He won't do that with you there. Like how you held back your tears when I first got here, because you knew I was hurt, and you wanted to show me that everything was going to be okay. Does that make sense? But, she said in a much smaller voice, It's okay, Amuto. You can talk to him when I bring him back. Because finding him and bringing him back... That's only half the challenge. The rest is to make him smile. You do that so much better than I do. I think you're up to the challenge. What do you think? So, maybe he could use her help to make Midoriya stay. Hitoshi could live with that. I... Okay. Okay, I'll make Deku smile again. Just like he did for me. She proclaimed, filled with stubbornness and determination. Good kid. Hitoshi just had to hold up his end of the deal. Remember not to open the door for anyone. You can have snacks for dinner tonight if nobody's home by then, but nothing super sugary. Your bedtime is still 9.30, Hitoshi said, as if he didn't already know she would stay up waiting for Midoriya. And don't do anything stupid, okay? Okay, she chirped. Hitoshi prayed that this wasn't a bad idea, then stepped out of the door and locked it behind him. He gave himself an allowance of three deep breaths before he moved any further. He needed them. Hitoshi almost missed him. It was starting to get darker, and the sun setting over the ocean made it hard to look without being blinded. But he saw him. Midoriya was lying flat on the sand, bare feet just barely above the waterline. He was passively surprised that he got there before his parents. He was worried Midoriya's friends would forward the conversation to their teacher, but they must not have. Were they giving him a chance? He couldn't waste it. He wouldn't. He just didn't quite plan this far ahead. What was he even supposed to do? Well, the first step had to be to get closer. He couldn't very well yell his apology at Midoriya. And then, he had to talk. The few people that talked to Hitoshi should probably say that he was a good conversationalist, surprisingly. They'd say it's probably because of his quirk. And they're halfway right. It wasn't an innate ability. But because Hitoshi had the quirk he did, he trained. He studied sociology. He read every how-to guide out there for how to talk to people, both in general and in specific circumstances. He even went to public spaces where no one knew him to practice these skills. So he knew mimicry would do wonders, be a little awkward, copy his body language, that stuff. He knew this wasn't a situation to be goal-oriented in. He couldn't be thinking about how to convince Midoriya to come home with him, because if he did, Midoriya would most likely notice that not all of Hitoshi's attention was on him. That's generally bad in conversations, but especially in this one. So go in willing to be distracted. Go off track a little. He also knew that Midoriya always responded well to openness too, to emotional honesty, which was terrible for Hitoshi, but it's a sacrifice he was willing to make if it came down to that. But he'd save that for if the other stuff wasn't enough. Two deep breaths. He could do this. Hitoshi walked up to Midoriya's prone form and sat. Midoriya, Hitoshi said, just to get his attention and make sure he wasn't dissociating again. Midoriya's eyes slid over him. They were focused enough, Hitoshi thought. Midoriya, I'm... Look, I'm sorry. 
I was wrong to treat you like that. And I was probably factually wrong too. And I shouldn't have done any of that. So, I'm sorry. Very awkward. So, good job? Too harsh? It's fine, was Midoriya's answer. Then he looked back at the fire-painted sky. It's clearly not fine. Midoriya closed his eyes with a tired sigh. Why are you here? His question had the tone of a complaint, and Hitoshi nearly snarked back at him. But he stopped himself. He needed to do better than what he did last night. To take you back to the house. But why? Midoriya asked. And this time, it was a real question. And damn, it was a good one. Hitoshi could have told his dads, or let Ida do it. He didn't have to be here. He shouldn't be here. What he said to Bokugo was true, but not really. He had a feeling that Midoriya would know, so he needed to come up with something better. He settled down on his back, emulating Midoriya's position. He didn't see whatever it was that Midoriya saw in the sky. He closed his eyes instead and simply thought. He supposed he was there because he felt guilty, but was that really all? Guilty? Ashamed? Responsible for this mess? But there was something more. If he just felt guilty, he wouldn't go this far. He'd stay with Eri like he was supposed to, draft a better apology, prepare his room better for Midoriya, and help Eri plan what she wanted to say when he got home. He'd be better, and he'd help fix it, but he wouldn't... He wouldn't have done something so risky. Logically, he should have told his dads, who actually knew what to do. So, there was something else. Something in what Dad had told him earlier. But what? Dad said that what he did was unacceptable. Hitoshi was scolded by his father, so it's only natural that he would feel the need to restore that relationship as quickly as possible. That could mean going plus ultra, but that wasn't it because then he wouldn't have risked leaving Eri alone. He knew that he was going to be upset about that. Dad also said that misfortune favours no one, so he shouldn't assume. But Hitoshi couldn't change what he'd done already. He could do better moving forward, but the damage was already done here. He couldn't make up for that by just improving this particular relationship, and he didn't completely buy that anyway. Before that, Dad had... He'd listed a bunch of things that could happen to people, even people with socially ideal quirks. They could be struck by natural disasters, abused, isolated, victims. Something happened to Midoriya. Fine, Hitoshi admitted it. Something must have happened if his mother was being investigated and Hitoshi's dads were letting him stay with them. So, what was it? Was that it? He was curious? In his experience, curiosity doesn't often come with this feeling of dread, though. Even morbid curiosity didn't feel so... frightened? Concerned? Ah. He was worried. About Midoriya. He really didn't see this coming. But it didn't change anything. His plan was the same. Dad spoke to me before he left to join the search for you. Hitoshi said into the silence that had enveloped them, his eyes still closed. He said... He said a lot of things, but... But I think I got the message. Hitoshi lied, just a little. That bad things can happen to anyone. That just because... Just because you don't deal with the same... Shit. Stuff. Prejudice? Uh, prejudice doesn't mean that you didn't deal with any other prejudices natural disasters aren't prejudices traumatic experiences nice and pain olympics midoriya interrupted unconsciously what hitoshi snapped out of his carefully crafted thoughtful expression just to look at midoriya from the corner of his eyes midoriya startled and made a confused noise so hitoshi repeated what he'd overheard it made the previously catatonic boy flinch. Sorry. No, what does that mean? He always apologised, Hitoshi realised. Sorry seemed to be Midoriya's default response to everything. Does he always feel like he's being accused of something? That everyone is upset with him, 
even when he's doing something innocuous, that everything is somehow his fault. Maybe Hitoshi was overthinking it because of his dad, looking for signs where there weren't any. Or maybe he was seeing them just now because he finally knew to look. Because he was worried. Ridiculous. It's comparing trauma, Midori explained hesitantly. It's saying, what happened to me is worse than what happened to you, so I'm, um, more valid than you. Oh. Oh no. Or the opposite, Midoriya continued. Like, what happened to me isn't as bad as what's happened to other people, so I don't have the right to feel hurt or get better. It's, um, it's a difficult thing not to do, for some reason. And it's the pain Olympics because it feels like a competition for who has it worse. Fuck. That was... That was literally Hitoshi's entire justification for his continued judgement of hero brats. Shit. Should he stop calling them that? Fucking damn it. What the fuck? Well, I feel extra stupid for what I said now. Hitoshi mumbled mildly. He had a feeling his true feelings would be a little too much for this situation. Sorry. Always an apology. I guess I do it too, if it makes you feel any better. You do? Wait, what was this? Was this Midoriya's dark side? Yeah, like, I don't think I can be hurt. Other people are more hurt, so I should just deal with it. I don't deserve to feel pain when bad things happen to me. Motherfucker. Well, now I feel extra sorry for what I said earlier. Sorry, Midoriya said once again. You're apologising. Because I realise that I've done something wrong and that I need to apologise. You realise that? Oh, sorry. Jesus fucking Christ. No, I'm sorry. Okay. There. That's better. Hitoshi took a deep breath. He just needed a second to reevaluate. Was Hitoshi's way of thinking... Was it really like that? Was he... Okay, he could deal with that later. He could panic later. For right now, he had to get through this. And he had to start with actually answering Midoriya's question. He could stick to the plan, right? Anyway, um, Dad helped me understand. At least a little bit. And, and it made him worried? Not really. Not that quickly. And at, at first I panicked, his mouth said honestly. Hitoshi didn't... he wasn't sure what was the truth anymore, so he couldn't... he couldn't manipulate this. He couldn't control it. Was coming here a mistake? Was it too late to turn back? He had to just... he had to keep on going. I panicked because I thought that if you did experience something, if you weren't faking, then you weren't bad. You weren't someone I needed to protect my family from. But if you weren't bad, then what? What was it? That had to mean that you're good. You're cheerful, kind, powerful. Everything a parent could want from a child. And I'm not. Midoriya shifted to look at Hitoshi. So if they had you, then they wouldn't want me. Hitoshi realised. That's why. That's why Hitoshi was so cruel to him last night. Hitoshi really was the opposite of Midoriya, wasn't he? Suddenly, that didn't seem like such a good thing. Shinzo... Wait, let me finish, please. I... This is hard, Hitoshi admitted. Midoriya just made a soft noise of confirmation. A sympathetic one. It didn't make Hitoshi as angry as it would have before. So, I felt threatened, jealous, and ashamed all at the same time. And then Dad scolded me and left to go look for you. Midoriya grimaced, so Hitoshi clarified. I told him he should, that he could talk to me more when you were safe. A few hours passed and 
I calmed down, but all I could think about was how everyone was miserable because of me. I felt so guilty and I just wanted to fix it, to own up to my mistake and make everyone happy again. You'll be a good hero, Midoriya murmured unintentionally, like it was a fact and that was all there was to it. Hitoshi took a sharp breath and felt his face warm. He didn't think he deserved to hear that right now. No, he said the words softly, with conviction wrapped in fluffy down. No, I wish I could claim something like that. But in truth, there was another motive. I came to you because I'm worried. Suddenly, Hitoshi's vision was filled with green. Midoriya pushed himself onto his elbows to get a better view of Hitoshi, which allowed Hitoshi to get a better view of Midoriya's bewildered face. Yeah, I'm surprised too. I didn't even realise it at first. Hitoshi sat up completely, and Midoriya mimicked him so they were fully face to face. I thought it was just guilt and responsibility, you know, like owning up to my mistakes. But I could have done that more easily, even more efficiently, at home where I could actually think of a good apology, and since I was supposed to stay there, my, our, dad and Otosan will probably be mad at me when we get home. I should have stayed and let them come get you. They probably do a better job of, of convincing you to come back. But I couldn't. I had to come myself. And the only explanation I could come up with was that I was worried. Midoriya just blinked at him without comprehension. He didn't understand that Hitoshi was sorry, that Hitoshi didn't want Midoriya to be homeless and in pain. He never wanted that, not even when he told Otasan not to look for Midoriya. He didn't want this. He just didn't know how bad it really was until Dad's lecture. I thought all about the things that Dad said, Hitoshi explained. He listed a lot of things that could happen to someone, even if they have a socially acceptable quirk. What I did to you was bad enough regardless, but I guess I thought, if Midoriya isn't faking it, then something bad happened to him, and now he's missing. So I just... He trailed off, gesturing vaguely between the two of them. It, it's really not... Midoriya started twisting his fingers. Shouldn't he be more careful? I mean, it's it's not like really bad thing. It's just like, I mean, I know it wasn't good, but really, it's not that bad, and you don't have to worry. Is this also the Pain Olympics? Hitoshi cut him off instead of grabbing Midoriya's hands like he wanted to, just to stop the twisting. Midoriya's mouth hung open for a moment before he closed it with an audible pop. Hitoshi guessed that meant yes. At this point. Hitoshi didn't even care what happened to Midoriya. Something was wrong enough to put his parents that on edge, and with the way Midoriya acted. It's not my place to decide whether whatever happened is bad enough for your mom to lose parental rights. I have absolutely no idea why you're staying with us. But I know that Dad and Otasan are worried, and I know that you're always apologising and flinching and acting like you're not. I don't know worthy of basic things. Midoriya flinched and ducked his head. And then you ran away because I said terrible things to you while you weren't... when you were already suffering. So, of course, I'm worried. He heard a sharp inhale before the words fumbled out of Midoriya's mouth. I... no, it's not... I... I don't... I'm... you should... shouldn't... I thought... Midoriya gasped out. I'm sorry... Midoriya's voice separated his words. His head was down, but Hitoshi could still see his red face, and he could hear the tears in Midoriya's voice. Hitoshi almost instinctively softened his voice. Hey, it's alright. He tried, holding his open hands up. It's not... That's not a bad thing, Midoriya. I'm not mad or upset. Midoriya deserved to have people worry about him when something was wrong. He deserved care, and he deserved help, but Hitoshi couldn't put that in words. All he could do was repeat, It's okay, no one's mad, it's okay. No, no, I'm, I'm causing problems again. 
he whispered through sniffles and small gasps. Sawa sensei must be mad. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. He brought his arm up to cover his eyes. Midoriya, Midoriya, shh. Hitoshi hushed him, and Hitoshi felt like an idiot for doing it. But they were only on the beach at all because of him in the first place. He had to try. He gently placed his hands on Midoriya's shoulders. The resulting flinch was hard enough that Hitoshi could tell it apart from the force of his trembling breaths. But Midoriya stayed. So Hitoshi did too. He just kept repeating soothing mantras over and over again. He calmed down. Eventually. Hitoshi couldn't tell if he was any help, but he found himself hoping that he was. He... he really wanted to help. He didn't care about his mission or obligations anymore. He just wanted to help. I'm sorry, Shinzo, was the first coherent thing he said. Didn't he understand that he hadn't done anything wrong? Hitoshi sighed, but gave him a small, genuine smile. He was surprised to see Midoriya actually relax a bit at the sight of it. It's all good. You don't need to be sorry. Right, so... Midoriya cut himself off and clamped his hands over his mouth. It's all right, he soothed anyway. And really, no one is mad. Midoriya looked at him doubtfully. No, listen, Otasan. I don't think he's ever got that angry at me. Any relief he gained from Midoriya's smile drowned in the memory of the voice Hitoshi's father used on him. A sombre tone took over Hitoshi's own voice, coupled with shame. I tried to tell him that, that he shouldn't look for you. And he didn't yell at me, but his composure was slipping, and he snapped at me. I don't... I'm not sure you understand how rare that is. And it's because he was worried. He was upset that I hurt you. And he was upset because he didn't know where you were. And he was... He was worried. Just worried. He cares about you. He doesn't, Midoriya bit out. I'm just the problem child. That hit right in the centre of Hitoshi's chest. Midoriya really thought that. Midoriya, Hitoshi started softly. That isn't... He doesn't mean it like that. How else could he possibly mean it? Dark hair fell over Midoriya's eyes, shadowing his face. His fist clenched in the sand tight enough that Hitoshi could hear his bones creak. Fuck. He means... He means that... Stop. Don't rush in. Don't be foolish. He cares. You wouldn't have a nickname if he didn't. I know it sounds harsh, but but it was affectionate enough to make Hitoshi jealous. It was enough to sour his victory in training if Dad came home and said, Sho, you're not going to believe what your problem child said in class. It was parental enough to hurt when he texted Hitoshi that they couldn't eat lunch together because something's wrong with my problem child. It hurt because you're not a problem child. You're his problem child. Hitoshi finally continued voice faint as the memories played out. You're not some kid you got stuck with that isn't worth the effort. You're not... You're... You don't make the problems. You're the kid that gets wrapped up in problems. The well-meaning, clever kid that he has to watch out for. You aren't a problem or a burden. You're a kid and a hero and he wants to take care of you. His problem child. When Hitoshi blinked hard to clear his reverie, Midoriya stared at him with wide, vulnerable eyes. I... I saw a sensei? He breathed. Yeah, Hitoshi said, just as lightly. He... he can't. Midoriya's voice was thick with emotion. His eyes were wet. He... I'm not... Dad cares about you too, you know? What? Yamada sensei? Midoriya asked. He sounded so lost so small. Hitoshi nodded. But we've, we've barely even... You really don't know, do you? What? The effect you have on people, it's... Hitoshi huffed. Never mind. All you need to know is that Dad adores you. Even if you hadn't interacted that much, he's always talking about you, telling stories, praising something you've done, complaining about your essays being so long. 
Hitoshi trailed off to a watery giggle from Midoriya. Dad's soft for kids anyway. He's more than happy to take care of one in need, especially if the kid is you. Midoriya had a hand covering his mouth, and his breath was shuddering more, but he stayed silent. He listened. And Eri... You know she loves you, and you being in her life has done nothing but help. All the stuff I said before... Hitoshi shook his head. Stupid. Completely unfounded. You love her, and so living with us would add to the care she gets from us, not subtract. And that just leaves me. I... I know I've been... Hitoshi sighed. There wasn't a word good enough, so he let the silence speak for him. But the things I said... I know, Midoriya whispered wiping his face with his sand-covered sleeve. You already said. Yeah, but... But it wasn't enough. But he meant it, but he didn't. But he was sorry for everything. You still think I hate you? Don't you? Midoriya sniffled. Even if you're sorry for what you said, that doesn't change that you dislike everything about me. Hitoshi opened his mouth to respond, but words fled from his mind. It wasn't true. It wasn't. But Hitoshi didn't even know where to begin with an explanation. Hitoshi didn't even know what he really felt about Midoriya at this point, but he knew it wasn't like that. Maybe just explain where he's at and how he got there. That's not true. Hitoshi could do this. It's just, before now, everything you did, I saw it wrong. Like, Like if you were being kind, I thought it was just an act to gain popularity. If you were brave, I thought it was just arrogance. I just... I took every positive trait that you have and twisted it until it was shaped the way I wanted it to be. The person I made was despicable, malicious, scheming, manipulative. I hated him. I hated the version of you that I made in my own head. But now... Now I think that you're nothing like him. Hitoshi glanced up from where his eyes had fallen onto his lap. The setting sun shone off the fresh tear tracks on Midoriya's face. On sorry, Midoriya. The sob that came out of Midoriya was forceful enough to hurt. It had him folded in on himself, cries coming out more like screams. He cried as if he'd been holding it in for an eternity, waiting for a release he thought would never come. The harsh sounds echoed in the space between the two boys, broken only by his own body's desperate fight for breath. It wasn't a pretty sight. It was painful, ugly, and tragically alluring. He cried with a misery, with a freedom that made Hitoshi's breath stutter, as his own laments fought to break free. Even like this, it was impossible to ignore Midoriya's influence. Hitoshi couldn't speak. If he tried, only sobs would come out. He was helpless. He was helpless and his voice was dammed up by the beast trying to claw up his throat, but he had to do something. He couldn't talk without breaking down, but he could move. He could move. He inched forward until their knees touched, then draped his lanky body over Midoriya in approximation of a hug. He tried to hold his tears back. He did, but, well, Midoriya didn't seem to mind. Instead, they just stayed like that, with Midoriya just trying to breathe while Hitoshi laid over him, both sobbing. It would have been a terrible sight to see, but it was wonderful. So they stayed. They stayed like that as the sun fully set and the stars came out. Finally, Izuku shifted, so Hitoshi sat up. They were both silent. Neither boy knew how to break the atmosphere, nor did they know if they should. But... They had to eventually. Hitoshi had his deep breaths, but he suspected the only thing Izuku had was anxiety and poor impulse control, so it had to be him. Two deep breaths. Want to get some ramen? Hitoshi blurted. Huh? Well, you probably haven't eaten in a while, and I'm getting kind of hungry, so... Izuku stared at him for a full five seconds, but then he blinked. It was like a light switch, the way Midoriya's face lit up with small giggles. Yeah, sure, 
he grinned. Hitoshi smiled back. Genuinely smiled. Okay, Hitoshi confirmed. But then a thought crossed his mind. And they were friends now, so... By the way, Hitoshi stood up and offered his hand to Izuku. Did you really clean the whole beach? Class 1A. Shinzo. Image description. Shinzo holds the phone out with a smirk, with noticeable sand in his hair and on his dark clothes. He's sitting at a table, which holds a lopsided tray of fast food. On the other side of the table, Midoriya is sipping on a soda, clearly unaware of the picture being taken. He is also covered in sand, and his face is splotchy, but he is smiling and looks to be enjoying himself. Scent, 907. Shinzo. Eat your words, fuckers. Scent, 907. Hello there, beautiful people. It's Ella, and I hope you're all having a lovely day today. Wow, this fic hurted. <laughs> Honestly, this fic took so long to record. I've been working on it, like, since the beginning of the month. I've even switched mics during the making of this, so hopefully the transition between the two isn't too noticeable. But this fic, ugh, oh, it broke me. I read it at, like, two in the morning which first mistake and I was just crying just like sobbing in bed like oh my god this would make such a beautiful pod fic I really hope I can make it and well I got the green light so here it is hopefully it made you feel how it made me feel sorry if you're crying but not really because I must be joint in my tears but did you get down in the comments and let me know? We can gush about the fic. We can gush about anything. You know, I just love talking to all you guys. And whilst you're there, it seems like we're feeling the vibe for 1000 subs is to do a live stream. Please let me know down below what kind of times you think would work for you. But also put the time zone because like, I mean, if you put it into British time zones for me, that would be great. Like GMT. Mm would love that but if I have to go and do the math I guess I will do it but just for me to get a kind of bit of an idea because I know different sides and I don't want to do it while you guys are like all in bed or in school or like at work or whatever but you know whilst you're down there commenting maybe go ahead and give the video a like if you liked it and to boost serotonin and you know if you're already there you might as well subscribe and be notified when I make new videos. On a side note, can we have a moment for the new profile pic? Yes, I did commission a good friend of mine to do this for me. And she gave me sparkly hair and that's all I've ever wanted. Okay. And yes, my hair's pink. The secret's out now. I do have pink hair. Uh, well, at the moment, it's more of a bit of a ready pink. But it actually changes all the time. But most of the time, it's gonna be pink. I always come back to pink. How can I not come back to pink? But until I see you again, be sure to practice some self-care, okay? Go to sleep on time. Have that shower you've been putting off. Drink your water. I'm serious. Drink the water. Are you drinking it? You better be drinking water. You better be running to the kitchen right now to grab yourself a cup of water and gurgle it down. Because yes, this is a threat. <laughs> I will see you guys later. Hey, don't be like that. Hitachi scope. Who the fuck is Hitachi? <laughs> uh, why do I keep saying Hitachi? Hitachi isn't even a person. Fuck's sake. Oh, I'm a fucking pod ficker, but I don't know how to bloody read. <sighs> Jeez. Okay, <laughs> let's do that again.